just kind of, you know, floating around. You know, they're Christians, all right, but yet they're not really receiving or be receiving the benefits or enjoying the benefits of the blessings of we, you know, of what the Word's made available to us. And so, for us to be able to do so, to enjoy those blessings, we have to be diligent in doing what the Word says. And God's given us so many promises and so many wonderful things. Yeah. You know, if we talk about the subject of healing. One thing we need to understand, healing is not a promise. Healing is a settled fact. Amen, it is. It's not a promise. It's an absolute. It's part and parcel with the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. You can't have salvation without having healing included in it. And so, you know, for so many people to have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, but have not accepted Him as healer is a sad thing. And so... But it takes doing what the Word says. It takes standing on the Word. It takes on finding out what the Word says. We discussed the meditating of the Word, the importance of us thinking about it, pondering it, amen, keeping it in front of our eyes. And so many different scriptures we have that we can stand on. But let's look today at what happened when Jesus became the curse for us. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 says this. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, or come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So let's look at this again. He hath, the half past tense, redeemed us, amen, from the curse of the law. See, the curse belonged to every human being as a result of Adam's sin. But Jesus redeemed us from it. Now, the price for the curse had to be paid. But Jesus is the one that paid it for us. And so, you know, there was a curse. Because man disobeyed, he was in a position to live under the curse. Because Jesus obeyed and then willfully laid his life down, he chose to redeem us by becoming a curse for us. So he's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, but it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Now, you know, there's a lot of people when we think about the Old Testament, we're living in the New Testament, and we are. But yet the, all the benefits of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, they still belong to us in the New Covenant. Because we're in a New Covenant that's found on greater and better promises. It doesn't do away with the promises we had in the Old Covenant. It just extends those into the new covenant. Amen. And so Jesus is the one that became the curse for us so that we might have healing and health in our lives and in our bodies. Okay? So that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now if we drop down to the 29th verse, notice what it says here. And if ye be Christ. Now what does that mean? That means if you're born again. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior then you have been born again. Amen. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you're saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you've done that, the Bible says you're saved. That means you become in Christ. You're in him. And because you're in Christ, the Bible says, then are you Abraham's seed, and your heirs according to the promise. Well, what the kind of things did God say to Abraham? Well, God said a lot of things to Abraham when he made a covenant with him, didn't he? Amen. He said he'd bless him. And he said, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Hallelujah. And so we're still, you know, enjoying the inheritance of the Abrahamic covenant. And because of that, in us, nations of the earth are still blessed too. Because we could take the gospel message to them. We can go out there and preach the good news. Preach means to proclaim. Every one of us, you know, in a sense, as a believer, is a preacher. We all have, you know, the word preach means to proclaim, make known. So when we go out and share Jesus with people, in essence what we're doing is we're proclaiming that he is a good God. We proclaim the truth to him, and the gospel, the Bible says, is good news. And so good news, we're going to tell them people good news. Hey, if you were lost, you don't have to be lost anymore. Amen. If you're bound by the enemy, you don't have to be bound anymore. That's right. If you're sick, you don't have to be sick anymore. That's right. Hallelujah. Because of what Jesus has done. 
So if we're in Christ, we're Abraham's seed, and we're heirs according to the promise. Now for us to grasp the reality of what it means to be redeemed from the curse of the law, then we're going to have to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to have to look at what the curse entails. Okay. Now, notice when we think about it, when we look at what he said there, he said that when we're you know, in Christ, we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So looking at Deuteronomy 20, chapter 28, let's notice, first of all, what some of these promises are. In verse 28, verse 1, uh, chapter 28, verse 1, Deuteronomy, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. Notice he says that we'll just walk in the light. Well, what do you mean walk in the light of the, you know, the, the commandment, actually, that he gave us, when Jesus gave a new commandment to us in John's gospel. He said, a new commandment I've given you, you should love one another as I have loved you. And we talked about this earlier in the week, the fact that when that covenant of love, if we'll walk in the light of the covenant of love, we won't break any of the Ten Commandments that was given to curb sin. You won't go, you know, you won't cheat your neighbor, you won't lie about your neighbor, you won't kill your neighbor, you won't lust after your neighbor's stuff, you won't do those things, you won't bear false witness to him, against him, anything like that, will you? Now, if you love somebody, you won't treat them bad. Are y'all listening? Amen. So if we fulfill the law of love, then we're in good shape. Well, by doing that, then we're in a, in a position here to receive a blessing. Because this blessing was given to Abraham's seed. All these blessings, verse 2, shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 3, Blessed thou shalt, be, shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, the fruit of thy cattle, increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket in thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Well, you can't get much better than be blessed coming and going. Can you? Amen. That's what he's saying here. Verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Hallelujah. So even your very enemies, God's endeavoring to take care of them. Now, sometimes we don't think that. Sometimes we look at our enemies and the things and the attacks that they're, they're bringing against us, and we wonder, is there ever going to be any justice? But we know this. The Bible says they'll come out against us one way and flee from us in seven ways. If you'll just stand your ground, God will take care of the situation for you, but you have to stand your ground. The problem we have is we want to get there and get in the middle of the battle. But the Bible says it's not by might nor by spirit, but by my, you know, <laughs> Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And so we have to realize, that's in Zechariah 4, 6, we have to realize that, that it's not our ability that gets the job done, it's God's ability that gets the job done. Right. Amen? And so we have to focus on that. We want to jump in the, in the ring and start boxing ourselves. But we don't want to, you know, when we do that, we just get ourselves in trouble, don't we? And we don't let God's spirit be able to accomplish what he wants to accomplish and take care of the situation the way he wants to take care of it. Now notice what it says here, verse 8. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses. Yeah. Amen. That means you can have abundance. Storehouse you know, is a place where you've got things stored up. What for? Well, for whatever God wants you to do with it. But it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy those blessings too. Amen. Hallelujah. You ought to have something stored up. You know, some people think, well, I don't want to have anything, a savings account or anything like that, you know. No, you need to have some stored up. Well, you know, the, but you, you know what Jesus said about that? Guy built barns, you know, and didn't have enough and built more barns and stuff, and then he ended up losing his soul. Well, if they, those things have you, then you're in trouble. But if you have them, then you're in a position to be a blessing. Because if you don't have anything stored up, how can you bless someone if they're in need if you never have anything to bless them with? If all we're doing is living from, from moment to moment, then we're not in a position to bless someone if the opportunity arises or if you see a need that comes up. I said it last night. You know, had a gentleman, you know, an individual we support, ministry gift, and uh, they're going overseas to minister to some Muslim nations. And because of the situation, the people there, they're going to minister 
two, if they were to pay for their tickets, then that could trigger that they're coming there to preach and bring those people, you know, and put them little people in harm's way. So they have to pay for their tickets themselves to be able to get over there so there's no link to them and the individuals that are in those particular nations where they could come under scrutiny or literally come under fire, okay? And so whenever, you know, as soon as we heard about it, I just had it in my heart, we're just going to pay for those tickets. Are you listening? Amen. Well, could you put them on a credit card? Yeah, we could have, but that's not what God wants. And I mean, God, you know, not that God, you know, you can't use a credit card as long as you pay it off. But God wanted us to just be able to pay for those tickets and help them. It's two thousand dollars, you know, to get them over there to, do, you know, to do what's going to be done for souls to get saved. Amen. Well, thank God we had the money available to be able to just write them a check. Said, so, you know, I just sent them a text. Actually, I sent them a text at like ten, about ten thirty at night. As soon as I heard it, I sent them a text. I didn't think about it until after I sent it. Are you awake or not? You know, but I just sent them a text and said, uh, you know, how much is it you need? Well, they thought I was talking about another situation, and they, and they texted me back and said, well, we're getting that worked out right now. I said, well, I said, I'm going to send you at least $2,000 to help you with those tickets. Then they texted me back and said, oh, you're talking about the mission trip. I said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And they said, well... You know, I'll, uh, I'll let you know tomorrow. And I said, well, I apologize for, you know, if I woke you up. I didn't mean to wake you up. But I just want to let you know you got it so you don't have to be concerned about it. Now you can just go, get your tickets, fly over there, and be a blessing. Amen? Souls can get saved. People can get healed. And we don't know what the end result's going to be. Amen? Of the Spirit of God moving in those situations. Praise God. But if we weren't in a position to do that, we couldn't have helped them, could we? You understand what I'm saying? Say, well, that's easy for you to say because you got this money stored up or you got that. No, God can do that for every one of us. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I was telling Pastor Cam, you know, I mean, I, I, I store money away. You know, they'll, they'll give me money for pastor appreciation, you know, get, take up an offering for me or, or they'll, they'll take up an offering for my birthday or somebody will give me this or somebody will give me that or, or we or sell something or do something, you know, and I'll just take that money and I'll just tuck it away. You know, the, you know, before we got a big safe, you know, put, you know, put our, our guns and stuff in, you know, I mean, I believe in them too, so just throw that out there. But anyway, uh, yeah, but anyway, so I would just, I'd keep it in my wallet. And you know, when I had a wallet, you know, it had a little secret place in there and I'd stash money in there. Nobody knew how much I had. My wife didn't even know how much I had. I'm just stashing it away. God knew how much I had. Amen. But you know, there's been times. You know, you know, somebody blessed me or, or something like that, and I had money stashed away. And I remember one time, you know, somebody blessed me, and so I went to the bank and went to cash a check, and the Lord said, I want you to give all that money to Janet. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, it was not a small amount either. It was, it was a pretty good amount of money, but, you know, I'd, I, did, I didn't have my hands glued to it. It wasn't like yeah. those, like, here, honey. <laughs> you know? I just handed it to her, you know, and said, the Lord said to give that to you just to bless you because you're my wife. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I've had the Lord tell me to do that, to give to other people. I remember one day I was sitting in, in you was there, wasn't you, when Scott Webb was over in Champaign that one time? Oh, it's been several years ago. Anyway, we were sitting there, and he was talking about, you know, blessing your family and stuff like that. And I was sitting there, and at that particular time, the best vehicle we had was our minivan. It was a 1992 Ford uh, minivan. Aerostar Aero is what it was. The best vehicle we had. And so we're just sitting there, and I'm listening to him, you know, and he's, he's teaching, you know, and I'm, uh, and I'm just sitting there listening. The Lord said, I want you to give your son David that minivan. Best vehicle we got. He said, I just want you to give it to him just to bless him. I said, Okay. So we got home, I told Janice, the Lord said to give David our minivan. So, okay, well, let's give it to him. Amen. Just to bless him. Now, I've had the Lord tell me to do that to other people. Just give things to other people just to bless them. Hallelujah. But if you don't have anything to bless with, then you can't bless, can you? 
That's why God wants us to have full, abundant provision. I don't believe that God, you know, I'm not against God, you know, making you to be a millionaire if you can handle the money. I'm not against that, but I don't believe that God is going to make everybody a millionaire because I don't believe everybody can handle a million dollars. I believe some people get a million dollars, they'll cost them their soul. And I've seen it happen to people. I've seen people inherit money and lose every penny in just a year or two. Every penny have absolutely nothing left over. Just blew it all and went hog wild. But I believe God wants us to be blessed. The Bible says right here he'll, he'll, he'll command a blessing upon our storehouses. Well, if you've got something stored up that God's got, got a hold of, that God can use whenever he wants to use it, are you listening to me? Then God will be, he'll bless it. He'll bless it and help it to grow and help it to flourish. So that he can, but when he, when he talks to you about it, you need to be sensitive to him and listen to him and obey him when he talks to you about it. Hallelujah. And remember we said this, we talked a little bit about it last night as well, but when we was talking about, we, we talked on, on how to train your human spirit, and the fourth thing you do to train your human spirit is, is quickly listen to the voice of your spirit. When God leads you, quickly obey. Don't drag it out for a week or two because you may miss the opportunity to be the blessing. And don't be, you know, like Saul was. Remember, Saul was told to do certain things. King Saul, he was told to do certain things at a certain time in a certain way. And when Samuel came, he heard all this bleeding and stuff going on. And so he said, what is that bleeding I hear? And so and he told me, he said, well, we kept the best to sacrifice to God. That's not what God said. God said, you wipe it out. He don't, don't, don't keep it. And that's when Samuel told me, he said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Yeah. So he said, well, well, we'll do it now. We'll get rid of it now. Well, now it's too late. See, we want to obey, obey God immediately. Obey the voice of your spirit immediately so then God can continue to bless you. All right. The Lord shall command thee the blessing upon thee in the storehouses and in all that thou settest thine hand to. How many of y'all want God to bless whatever you put your hand to? If you put your hand to a business venture, how many of y'all want it to be blessed? Amen. If you put your hand to doing something, you know, you want it to be blessed. I mean, if you put your hand to, to raising or growing a garden, you want it to be blessed. Don't you? You want a garden that produces. Amen. People drive by. You want them to be saying, man, I tell you what, they got a garden. Look at that. You don't have people all driving by and say, you know, that's nothing but a bunch of weeds. I don't even know why they put forth the effort. You don't want that. No, you want God to bless what you put your hand to. And God wants to bless what you put your hand to. That's what the Bible says. Hallelujah. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. When God gives you something, he wants you to be blessed. If he gives you land, he wants you to be blessed in what he gave you. Yeah. Verse 9, the Lord shall establish the unholy people unto himself. Now, there's a big deal right there. The Lord shall establish the unholy people. And it's not W-H-O-L-O-Y. It's holy, H-O-L-Y. A holy people. You know, the Bible says this in the New Testament, that we're supposed to be holy as he is holy, saith the Lord. We're supposed to live holy lives. Amen. And so it's something that we have to work on. Are you listening? Because we have to take charge of our lives. We trust the Holy Ghost on the inside of us to help us. But we have to take charge of our lives because when we accept Christ, our flesh continues to go the same direction it went before we got saved. But our spirit man's a new creature immediately. And when we're born again, our spirit man wants to serve God. But your mind's caught in the middle. Your mind, which we talked about before, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. But the Bible says, receive of meekness the ingrafted word which is able to save. That word save means to restore and renew our soul, which consists of a mind, will, and emotions. So when we get born again, our spirit man is immediately recreated. We're new creatures. Okay? But yet our soul, our mind, will, and emotions has to be renewed in order for it to come in line with our spirit man. Because the majority of your life your soul was in line with your flesh. Your flesh is dictating what it wants to do. And your flesh will kill itself if you let it. Amen. I mean, you don't think that. Just look at people's lives. I mean, you, you deal with you know, people that are you know, bound with drugs and alcohol. It's their flesh is craving that stuff. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that a devil can't get a hold of them eventually, but it doesn't just start out with a devil immediately. But their flesh is what gets hold of them. Okay. They start taking the drug or whatever, and it starts appealing to their flesh, and it starts appealing to their soul. Okay? 
that makes their flesh feel a certain way, so the flesh begins to crave that. Then it also begins to deal with their, their, their will and their emotions, their minds, okay? Their emotions begin to change as a result of the drug's influence in their life. And so now they got those two things in agreement and enjoyment of that drug, and so now they get bound by it. Are you listening? You have to take charge of that. You have to make sure. You, because the thing is, if that's the case, I was a drug addict. Let's put it out this way. I was a drug addict before I accepted Christ and was born again. And I mean, I'd take about every drug I could get my hands on, and I always abused them in every way I could. Because my flesh craved them. My flesh loved it. My flesh loved alcohol. And I craved it. Okay? Now, did the devil ever get a hold of me? Oh, the devil got a hold of me all right. I was full of devils. But it didn't start out that way. Are you listening? But when I got saved, I became a new creature on the inside. Then I had to begin to renew my mind with the Word of God. I had to start thinking differently and had to take control of my flesh. And I remember the first communion I took after I got saved, they served at that time. Now, we don't serve. We just use juice. But they served both actual wine and juice. And so I had made a decision that I am not going to drink the wine because I'd have been an alcoholic and I'm not going to drink the wine. Now, I'm not saying the Lord would tell you to do this, but that's why you have to listen to God for yourself. That's and you have to li listen to what his, his spirit says. But see, I had this, I was under the impression because I had been to AA that came out drinking. But I was under the impression that if I ever touched it, that I would just go right back to it. And I remember I was sitting in that communion service and I had a battle going on inside me. You know, my head's telling me you can't drink that wine. Because if you drink it, you just drink that one little cup in communion, then you're going to become an alcoholic. See, I had to learn some things, amen, because in AA, you had to keep saying I was an alcoholic, but you notice you heard me say I was an alcoholic, because I'm not an alcoholic anymore, I was an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic now, and I don't have to get up every day and say, hey, my name's David, I'm an alcoholic, no, I'm not, my name's David, and I'm a born-again child of God, I'm an heir and a joint heir of Christ Jesus, my father's royalty, hallelujah. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, and I know this, that I'm not an alcoholic any longer. But see, I had to learn some things and stop sitting in this communion service, and I got this battle going on on the inside of me because I'm, you know, I'm afraid, really. I'm afraid that if I drink this, that I'm going to go back to drinking alcohol. But then the Lord spoke to me and said, drink the wine. I said, Lord, I don't want to do that. He said, drink the wine. I said, Lord, I, I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want to go back to drinking. He said, drink the wine. He said, you don't have to be concerned about it because you're not that person anymore. That part of you died. You're not going to have a problem with it. Drink the wine. So I remember I drank the wine, never had a bottle problem with it. Never drank another drop since. Not one. What was God trying to teach me? He was telling me, you're not that person anymore. You're changed. You're not the alcoholic anymore. Well, I'm not the drug addict anymore either. That guy died too. And so I had a situation before my wife and I got saved. We was at the VP fair in St. Louis, huge fair. And uh, so we was there, and, and, and we were, you know, taking drugs and drinking, and, I mean, we were really loaded, to be honest about it. Matter of fact, I just got out of jail Friday afternoon where I could have ended up in prison for 10 years, which would have turned into a life sentence. I know that. Why? Because you've never been in prison. You don't know what goes on in there. And there's sometimes you've got to do things, and then when you do those things, it could turn into a life sentence. But anyway, I just got out of jail Friday afternoon, 4th of July weekend. And so we're at the VP Fair. We're taking what, you know, a drug called Quaaludes, you know, which was a downer. And we took a whole bunch of them. And we're drinking, you know, and, and so we were getting ready to leave, and we're walking over to the car, or stumbling, I should say. And so these young men come by, and uh, one was a pretty big boy. He's probably about 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, His buddy wasn't so much. He's probably about 5'9". And they come walking by and started yelling obscenities at Janet. And so I just told them in no certain uncertain terms where they could get off. You know what I mean by that? I can't say that mixed company. I wouldn't even say it, period. 
Even if it was all men, I wouldn't say what I said. And so they come over there, and this big guy comes walking up and just punches me in the face. Well, I didn't feel anything. <laughs> Taking all those quaaludes, I didn't feel a thing. And so I kicked him, and he went down. And Janet just started punching him in the head. Well, I got my wife. She's got my back. And I started in on the other guy. Well, I didn't realize it, but he got a hold of a baseball bat. And so he came up and cracked me in the ribs, broke my ribs. I didn't know, and I didn't know they was broken. Well, I grabbed the bat, tried to get it out of his hand. I couldn't get it out of his hand because he had a strap around it. It was around his wrist. And so I tried to get it out of his hand. Good thing I didn't because I'd have beat him senseless with it. Made him beat him to death. And so anyway, so then they took off, you know, to try to get away from us. And I jumped in the car and tried to run them down. And I missed them and hit a big old uh, railroad tire they had their kind of marking parking areas. And I ran over this railroad tire and got stuck and I couldn't get it to go. I was spinning my tires and I'm trying to get it off there so I could chase them down. About that time, I'm sitting there in the car and all of a sudden the window comes smashing in and a baseball bat hits me right upside of the head and broke my wi two of my wisdom teeth off. I was chewing my wisdom teeth. I didn't know what it was. See, I'm just, I'm loaded so bad. I didn't know what it was. I'm chewing them up. And I, and, he's, and I started spitting out these white pieces of stuff. Look like perlite. Say, what's perlite? If you, may, if you plant plants, you know, potted plants, you have to have something for drainage, and you either use perlite or vermiculite. You know, and then you put your soil on top of that, and then it drains through, you know. And so it's kind of like little white rocks. And so I'm just chewing on this stuff, and I didn't know what it was, and I started spitting it out. But I didn't find out till later is my teeth. I was chewing my teeth. You know? And so then I just got out and, and I went and got the bumper jack out of the, out of the back of the car and took off after them. And I'm chasing them down the parking lot, you know, and they're running now. And so uh, I come, and they're running away from me, and I'm coming after them, you know, I'm stumbling around because I'm all messed up on quaaludes and alcohol. And, and I'm coming, and I come up on this brand new Lincoln, white Lincoln Mark IV. And I don't know why I made to do it, and I just started smashing the windows out of it. And I hit the back window so hard, the jack flew out of my hand, went through the window, and, into the, and landed into the back seat. About that time, there's red lights everywhere. And here comes the cops. Well, here they see me. I'm the one that's going nuts. You know, so they come up and grab me, you know, and they're trying to handcuff me, but I didn't want to be handcuffed because I got a whole pocket full of quaaludes, and I had a pocket full of cash. And so they're trying to handcuff me, and I just put my hands up over the car so they couldn't reach my hands to handcuff me, you know. I wasn't fighting them or trying to punch at them or anything, but I just didn't want to be handcuffed because I'm trying to reach down in my pocket and get the drugs out of my pocket because I don't want them to take me and search, you know, search me because I just got out of jail Friday afternoon, and I don't want to go back. And so anyway, so I'm trying to get them out of my pocket, and all I did was throw my money on the ground. I lost every bit of my money almost. You know, I mean, I was dropping fifties and hundreds on the ground, trying to get, the, and then still had the drugs. I mean, how does it go? Just the way the devil is, isn't it? But then all of a sudden, the cops are trying to arrest me, you know. They got these other two guys. They got them standing over there. They're trying to arrest me, and I'm the one looking like, because they're over there yelling, he smashed the windows out of my mama's car. Well, I didn't even know it was their mama's car. But if I was going to smash them out, I guess I ought to be smashing the right guy's windows out. They're going to be doing it anyway. Not just a perfect stranger. Now, I'm not justifying my actions. You understand what I'm saying? And why are you telling the whole story? Because you've got to hear this part, too. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so while the cops are trying to handcuff me, they got these two guys over there. They're telling how I did all this. It was all my fault and all this kind of stuff. The fact that they broke my window out, broke my teeth off, broke my ribs was yelling obscenities to my, you know, girlfriend, who wasn't my wife at the time. You know, that had nothing to do with it because I'm the guy looking like the bad guy. You ever been in that situation? You look like the bad guy? You didn't do anything wrong? Well, I did do some wrong, but anyway. And all of a sudden, a guy comes out of nowhere. Just out of nowhere. The guy walks up, walks up to the police officer and says, I saw the whole thing. Said, these two guys... You know, jump this man and his girlfriend. Well, he didn't know she was my girlfriend. How do you know she wasn't my wife? 
and jumped them with a baseball bat, and the baseball bat they threw in the, in the bushes over here. It's right over here in the bushes. And then he walked out in the middle of a parking lot and vanished in thin air. So no, that was just the drugs. No, it wasn't the drugs, because everybody else was freaking out too. Are you listening? So they said, well, they went over and got the b baseball bat. And so they said, well, we got to take you downtown anyway because of just the commotion, and you're pretty wound up, so we want to make sure you're calmed down before we turn you loose. And so what they do, put us all in the back of the same paddy wagon. <laughs> now that's just brilliance, isn't it? <laughs> and so if we wouldn't have been handcuffed, we would have been added in the back of that paddy wagon. Janet's trying to drive the car over there, and there's a cop sitting there back with, back with us trying to keep the peace, you know. And so he's watching Janet, and Janet, she's like all over the road. He said, stop, she's going to kill herself if we let her drive. So the cop got out and drove her and our car to the cop shop, you know, so that she wouldn't kill herself trying to get to the cop shop. Okay, so I said all that to say this. Well, after I got saved, I had to have those teeth extracted. So I had two of them extracted, you know, and, and so the, the dentist told me, he said, well, now you need to do something about the top ones or the, the bottom ones because the top ones are broken because if you don't, they're going to gonna turn. You know, it said you, get, you, know, you don't have any kind of pressure on them. Wisdom teeth have a tendency you want to turn anyway. And he said, you're not going to have any pressure on them and stuff. And he said, so they can turn forward and cause you issues. And I didn't think about it. I just let it go. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started getting a toothache. I never had a toothache in my life. Never had a cavity to this day. And all of a sudden, that tooth started wearing on the tooth in front of it, wore a hole in it. And man, oh man, I feel bad for anybody that's ever had a toothache. Because that hurts so bad, I never experienced anything like that. So I had to go, you know, to get it extracted. And so when I went to get it extracted, it was abscessed, and it hurt so bad. And so the guy, the dentist, you know, he, tra he gave me 30 shots of Novocaine. How do you know? I counted them. Three vials. There was there was ten shots, ten injections in each one, and he inject. And it's still my. I couldn't even feel my head. If you had thumped me in the head, I wouldn't even known it. But that pain was still awful. Didn't do a thing for the pain. So then he starts cutting it out, and he cuts right into the nerve. Oh my! I was laying there on that table, you know, in that, in that chair, you know, and I'm I'm like this, and I'm screaming, because ah! it hurts so bad. Janet's in the waiting room, and she could hear me. Ah! You know, and I, and I mean, it hurts, man. And, he should, and he's breaking it and trying to get it out. I mean, hit that nerve again. Ah, and I'm screaming. And finally, he said, you're going to have to go to an oral surgeon. Well, you should have told me that right from the beginning. But anyway, so he said, I'll give you some pain medication. I said, well, I don't want you to make me high. He said, okay. So he gave me some pain medication. I took every pill that night because it hurt so bad. My word, I called him up next morning and said, you, I don't care what you have to do. Just make it stop hurting. Man, I don't know what he gave me to this day. But I went by and got, we got those pills. Janet, you know, she drove me because I'm, you know, I'm hurting so bad. So she drove me and went by. We got those pills. I took one on an empty stomach. And in 30 minutes, I was sitting in a Chinese restaurant chewing, chewing crab rangoons on an old exposed nerve and never felt a thing. <laughs> I was just eating to my heart's content. I never felt a thing. I'm sitting there in the passenger seat of the van driving, and I got my window head up against the window, and I'm like this, and drools just running down the side of my mouth. I mean, just dripping down on the floorboard, you know. I mean, I, I sit there in the house and just, you know, and then I preach too. And so Janet, we'd be sitting there praying in tongues the whole time I was preaching because you never knew what was going to come out of my mouth. She so didn't know what I was going to say. Amen. Now, you know how many people, listen to me, you know how many people that if they had been a drug addict and they would have gave them that kind of medication would have relapsed? Well, see, I'm not a drug addict anymore. Are you listening? I'm not a drug addict anymore. So I, I have I had taken pain medication? Yeah, I had to take it a few times. But I'm not, I'm not addicted to it because I'm not a drug addict anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you listen to what I'm talking about here? Why? Because I'm a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Now, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to go out on the street hey, and ask somebody if they got some quaaludes. I'm not going to go get some heroin because I used to do heroin. I'm not going to do that because that's wrong. 
But if I had to take pain, believe me, pain medication helped. That hurt. You ever had that hurt? Anybody ever had a toothache? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel bad for anybody that's ever had a toothache. I wanted to quit hurting. It's a whole lot easier sometimes to exercise faith whenever your body's not screaming in so much agony that you can't stand it. And I've told people for years, listen, if you need something to take the edge off so you can keep your confession right, then get the edge off so you can keep your confession right. Yeah. till you get your healing manifested. Amen. Hallelujah. But I'm not a drug addict anymore. That's old, old, passed away. See, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Amen. Hallelujah. How can we talk about, ah, uh, this was, the Lord led me to do it, so that's what we're doing. All right, now let's read back here. Hallelujah. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouse, and all that thou settest thy hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish the unholy people in himself, as he has sworn. Notice, holy people. Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Amen. We should be living holy lives. If thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. Now watch this, verse 10. All people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, and the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. In other words, God wants you to have abundant provision. That's part of the blessing. That's part of the covenant that God made with Abraham. What did God do for Abraham? Abraham left when God told him to leave. Abraham ended up in the mid, middle of a grievous famine. But yet God blessed him and made him rich in the middle of the famine. What's that tell me? When economic times are not good, God can still bless you. Doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of the world, God can still prosper you. That ought to be the very thing that's happened in the life of the believers. We ought to be prosperous. Even though everything else is in chaos, we ought to be in peace. We ought to be blessed. We ought to be prosperous. And that's what causes the people in the world to look at us and say, what's different about them? Right. Amen. I heard, I heard testimony. You know, down in Texas, years ago, East Texas, they had a big problem with bull weevils. But one farmer, you know, went to church, you know, Assembly God Church, paid his tithes. He made a crop, didn't have a problem. The pastor went out, you know. He'd go out there with them, you know. He'd walk down the field, pick a little cat and cotton, put it in their sack, you know, just talking and fellowshipping with them. And so this pastor, everybody else had a problem with bull weevils. But this pastor didn't. He made a crop, cotton crop. He didn't lose his crop. Matter of fact, you go over to the fence line where it got to his property and the bull weevils came over there and just died right there on his fence line. Couldn't come on his property. Amen. Hallelujah. Another farmer, they'd had a drought. Wouldn't rain, just spotty rain. This farmer, assembly God, you know, man, paid his tithes, you know, served God. It come a rainstorm and only rain on his property. Wouldn't rain on anybody else's property. And he made a crop when the rest of them didn't make a crop. God said he'll bless you. He wants you to be plenteous. He'll bless you. Amen. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. God's capable of taking care of us in spite of it. I mean, think about the God we serve. Think about how awesome this is. You know, they could, they could take all the currency we have right now, the U.S. dollar, and they could say it's not good. Now, you can't use a penny of it. You can't even cash it in. We're just going to stop it out. It's not worth anything, so it's not gonna, you can't buy anything with it. You've got to do something totally different. You know that God's your source and that God's capable of putting food in a pot? Are you listening to what I'm saying? God can put it in there. Yeah, well, I just don't know if I believe that. Well, you need to start believing that because that's the God we serve. And so he's not moved by natural conditions and natural things. He can make sure you, just like that woman, he made sure that meal barrel never went dry and empty and that oil cruise never went dry. There was a famine in the land. People are starving to death. And she was going to make her last little cake for her and her son to eat it. And they were going to eat that and then die. But the man of God said, just make me a little one first. 
People say, well, that's just like a preacher. Get his first. No, but notice what he said. He said, make me a little one first and then make one for you and your son. And she obeyed. And what happened? She kept making them cakes every day for the rest of the famine. That's right. Hallelujah. See, God didn't have to have. She didn't have to have a bunch of gold to go buy something. That's the thing we got to understand when it comes to the God we serve. He's not moved by all these natural things. These natural things is not what stops him from blessing you. I believe this with all my heart because I've seen him do it in our own lives. I mean, God can give you the ability to drive around on empty. I've seen him do it. He did it to us. We drove around for almost four days, three and a half days on empty. In a car that I know would never, would only because I ran out of gas in it before. I know where when the guy that needle got so far, you're about to go thunk, 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 and stop. But God said you need to go here, and we go there. And I told Jan, I said, you know, th th we got to believe God. And I mean, and we went, we drove for three and a half days on empty. And then one day, you know, at, at that fourth, third, third, actually the fourth day, because we didn't drive that rest of that day, the three and a half days, you know. That fourth day, we decided to go into Dairy Queen, and I made this stupid statement. I said, well, you know, I said, we've been driving around. I said, maybe the gas gauge messed up. Yeah, 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 I know you never do that, you know, <laughs> stupid. We'll just run into Dairy Queen and get us a peanut butter parfait. And so we started down the road. We didn't get down the road 100 feet and flat ran out of gas. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yeah. He said, don't ever compare my ability with a broken gas gauge. He said, if I didn't want you to go and get done what you need to get done, you would have never got anywhere. But I'm the one that had enabled you to drive around for three and a half days with no gas in your car. Now, I'm not telling you to be foolish and go out here and just get in your car on empty and try to go to California because you'll probably run out before you get to the ed edge of Fairbury. But the Lord said, he kept us going. We had to go to these different places. We had to, we, it wasn't like we just drove across town. We had to drive all the way to Sparta from Nashville. That's a pretty good haul. And then drive all the way back from Sparta to Nashville. Then we had to drive from town, Janet's mom and dad's house, out to where this trailer was we was going to rent. And had to go back and forth. Then we had to move our stuff, you know, out from their garage out there to it. So we had, uh, there's a lot of driving around. I mean, you might get an extra 10 or 15 miles, but you don't get, you know, 150 miles. Are you all listening? But God's able. The point I'm making is God's capable of supplying our need and doesn't have to have cash to do it. Now, we're living in a society where cash is used to do things, and so he'll bless us with that. But the point I'm making is if the cash is not available, does that stop God from blessing us? No. We have to realize that's the God that we serve. Amen? God can get us what we need. It doesn't matter. The children of Israel did not plant manna seed. They just reaped the manna harvest. God caused it to come for them every single day. What was God trying to get across to them? The same thing he's trying to get across to us. He's our source of provision every single day. Yes, we want, he wants us to have a storehouse so he can use us to, because we're living in a society that functions a certain way. So we have to operate within those parameters. But if those parameters ever change, does that stop God from blessing us? We don't have to have all those things. So if they, if, if they try to take those things away from us, we still got our God. And he's well able to supply what we need. If he has to create something for us, he can create something for us. It doesn't matter. That's the God we serve. So we can't be moved and motivated by this. Well, I've got to have it this way and I've got to have it that that way god doesn't have to have it that way to get you what you need he doesn't because he's your source of provision he's the creator don't forget that he still creates things today that's in his nature he is a creator and he'll create for us anything that we need for us to be able to live the god the life that god's created us to live are you listening to me hallelujah and these are the things you got to get settled in your heart yeah, we, we live in a society that functions a certain way. You go to the grocery store, they expect you to pay for that some way, some shape, some form. Either use a credit card, either you use cash, something like that, write a check, you have to use it. God understands that. But if you're ever in a situation where that doesn't function, that doesn't work, it doesn't stop God from being able to bless you. 
It doesn't stop him from meeting your need. It doesn't stop him from providing you with the food that you need to eat or the clothes that you need to wear. God can do it. The children of Israel, listen to me, walked around for 40 years and their shoes never wore out and their clothes never wore out. So, well, I want new stuff. I don't want to have to just keep wearing the same old thing, you know. Listen, when you're in a situation, you, you, you wear what you wear. And believe me, it'll be in and out of style multiple times in 40 years. I mean, you'll be the trendsetter. Hallelujah. Are y'all getting anything out of this or not? Mm -hmm. I'm encouraging you to trust in the God that you serve. Verse 10, all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy ground, and the, and the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, and heaven to give the rain unto thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. You mean we're not supposed to borrow money, go to the bank and borrow money from a car? That's not what he's saying, because if it was a sin to borrow, it would be a sin to lend. What do you mean? Every time you lent to somebody, you'd be causing somebody to sin. So it's not a sin to borrow. No, what he's trying to say is, I want you to get to the point where you're so blessed that you're doing the lending and not having to borrow. Wouldn't you rather be in that position, that you're the lender and not the borrower? Right. Yeah, it'd be a whole lot better to be in that position, and that's what God wants to get us to. He really does. That's part of the covenant. And the Lord shall make thee, verse 13, and the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Say, I'm the head. I'm, the head. I'm not the tail. And thou shalt be above only. Say, I'm above. above. And thou shalt be beneath. I say, I'm, ben I'm not beneath. No. If thou hearken to the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them, he's going to make you the head, not the tail. You'll be above only, not beneath. You'll be the victor, not the victim. You'll be more than a conqueror through him that loves you and gave himself for you. He'll enable you to do whatever it is he's called you to do. And because the word's working in you, the power of the word's working in you, that he can do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ever ask or think according to that power that's working in you. And God can bless you and you'll be blessed coming. You'll be blessed going. People will see you're blessed. They'll know you're the blessed of the Lord. They'll talk about you behind your back and say, you know what? I know they may be kind of quacky over there because they're all about this Jesus stuff. But I want to tell you what, they're driving decent automobiles. They got decent homes. They got their needs met. I mean, I've seen them go through tests and trials they got a smile on their face they got joy in their heart i mean they're jumping and shouting i don't know why they ain't got nothing to shout about but they're doing it anyway they got a peace that seems to pass all understanding i don't see how they can do it i just don't see how they can do it amen, amen. and secretly when they go home at night they'll be talking to their wives you know what i was up there at the bar last night And they got to talking about them church folks. And you know, it's right. I've been watching them. I work with some of them. And you know, they got a smile on their face no matter how bad it seems. They talked about a layoff. They talked about shutting us down. They talked about laying us off. And everybody's in an uproar. But you know, those Christians just smile and say, don't matter to me one way or the other. God got me this one. He'll get me another one. This is just a tool God's used to sustain me for this particular point in time. But God's well able to continue to sustain me. He's not moved. God didn't fall off the throne just because of that situation. God's still on the throne. He's still high and lifted up. His train still fills the temple. For yea, I am the God that's more than enough. I am the all-sufficient God. But you must see me that way in your own eye. It doesn't matter that others see me that way and walk in those blessings, but you must see me that way. I must be your El Shaddai. I must be the all-sufficient God to you. You have to have it settled in your own heart, saith the Lord, that I am the God that will supply all of your need. You have to focus on that and not your circumstances and situations that you see. You must stay focused on what my word 
word says, for I surely can take care of thee. I can sustain thee. I will hold you up in the right hand of my righteousness, saith the Lord, and I'll make sure any enemy that comes against you will definitely flee from you in seven ways. I'm here to tell you, saith the Lord, that I'm your God. I am your very own Father, and my blessings are available to each and every one of you. The only key is you must believe. That's what the Holy Ghost is saying. Woo! Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we need to heed it, don't we? We need to listen to it. Man. Woo! Glory to God. My, 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 my. We just need to take a minute and worship Him for that. Lord, we worship You. We praise You. We thank You. You are the God that's more than enough. My word, Lord, you're so awesome. You're so wonderful. You're so glorious. Whoo, glory to God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your wonderful holy name. Praise your wonderful holy name. What a great and awesome God you are. Thank you, Lord God, that you are El, are El Shaddai. Yes, you're our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that provides. You're Elohim, the almighty, all-powerful, all-creating God, the God that's more than enough. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we magnify you. Hallelujah. We exalt you. My, 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 my. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whew. Verse 13, The Lord shall make thee the head, not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of these words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. So what's God saying? If we'll do what he said, this is what happens. This is what belongs to us. But if we don't do what he says, verse 15, it shall come to pass if thou wilt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of curses here. It goes from sickness to disease to lack. You can plant, and a varmint's going to destroy every bit of it. He even goes as far to say, you'll marry a woman and she'll lay with another man. That's part of the curse. It's exactly right. That's part of the curse. Infidelity is a part of the curse. Now think about that. God doesn't want that in your life. He wants you to be blessed. Now we're not going to take the time to read through all the curses because there are they're, 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 they're many. But let's just drop down to the 61st verse. Also, so he, he, he lists all these curses all the way from the 15th verse, all the way down to the 61st verse, he's talking about curses, about bad things. But watch what he says here in verse 6. Also, and then also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law. So he covers all these curses that are here, and then in the 61st verse, he said in every sickness and everything that's not even written here, is all the curse. It's all part of the curse. Every sickness, every disease, is part of the curse. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse. So that means he's redeemed us from everything that's written here in this book here in Deuteronomy plus every sickness, every disease that's not mentioned here, he's redeemed us from every single one of them so that we can walk in victory. We can walk in health. Hallelujah. We can walk in prosperity. Turn back to Galatians chapter 3 now. What time we got? Anybody got a watch? 11.30. Okay. Let's look at this real quick. Are you getting anything out of this? I pray that you are. We're Hallelujah. So let's look at the 13th verse again. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
being made a curse for us, for it is written, Curses everyone that hangs on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. All those blessings we read, God wants us to have. All those curses, Jesus has redeemed us from. So what's awesome about it is it would have been good. Listen to me. It would have been good if we would have just been redeemed from the curses. That would have been good just in and of itself, wouldn't it? If we were just redeemed from the curses, the sickness, the, you know, the poverty, the lack, and all those things, we, just to be redeemed from those things, that would right there would just be phenomenal. But that's not what the Bible says. He didn't just redeem us from the curse. He made it available so that the blessings of Abraham, those first 14 verses, they could all belong to us. So not only are we redeemed from the sicknesses and the diseases and things like that, we're also made partakers of the blessing, the abundance, the blessing on your storehouse, the blessing on what you put your hand to, giving you all that, those things you put your hand to, do all those things for you, causing your enemies to flee from you seven ways, all those things. Those belong to us too. So not only do we miss out or supposed to miss out on these things, we're supposed to be partakers of all these things. And, you know, what's unfortunate many times is you'll have people that will say, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm redeemed from sickness, so I'm, I'm, but then not, they don't have any blessings in their life. They don't have any abundance in their life. And they'll say, well, you know, because that keeps us humble if we don't have anything. But that's not true either because God wants you to have something. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to have a storehouse. There's nothing wrong at all with you having a savings account. Are you listening? Right. At all. And you ought to be putting money away. You ought to. You ought to be putting some money away. If you want to put it in a bank, that's up to you. But if you want to, or if you want to put it in a safe, that's up to you. I like putting it in a safe, so I got it locked up, but I got access to it at any time I want to get to it. I'm not saying you can't get access to it from a bank, but how much do you really get from it in the bank? So it's just my choice to do it that way, but I got access to the cash. Are you all listening? Pastor Kim's been helping us, and, and you know, and, and so I got put it in my heart to bless him. And I told him I wanted to do something for him for helping me out, and he said, no, no, I don't want to do that. And I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I said, I'm just going to send you a check. You just do with it what you want. And he said, well, no, no, I'm not really, you know, and I said, so so we got to look at that guitar. So you, have, you, know, you know some new sounds he got coming out of the guitar up there? He had organ sound this morning. He started playing the organ, the Hammond organ. Did you hear that? Coming out of the guitar, is that the coolest thing ever? And so he went and got that, you know, and so there's a guitar that they make specifically for that, that you don't have to stick that on a guitar that's not made for it. There's a guitar, and so there's one, I said, well, I want to buy that for you. I want to bless him with it. Amen, are you listening? So I just grabbed some cash and we went home to bring it up here to be able to just take him out and bless him with that, to help him with that. Because he's been a blessing to us. Are you listening? Amen. Why? Because the Lord just put it on my heart to do it. I told Jan, I said, I believe the Lord wants us to do this. And my wife, I bless her heart. I mean, my wife's with me 100%. She's never bucked me ever. She's always with me 100%. She's always right there. Well, if the Lord said it, let's do it. Amen. When she was telling me about the, you know, the, the ministry friend of ours has needed that ticket, you know, as soon as she said it, she said, we need to do something. I said, yep. I said, we're going to give them at least $2,000. Okay. She never bucked me in that one bit. She never has. She's always been with me. Somebody told me, if the Lord told me, you know, to give something to somebody, she'd say, okay, let's do it. Let's do what the Lord said. Are you all out there? Hallelujah. Praise God for that. That's a blessing right there. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I know folks, man, I tell you what, I know folks, I've seen ministers that are not in the ministry today because their wives bucked them so hard. But you know, you have to have, you know, you do have to have track record. You can go out and do some crazy things a thousand times in a row and then want your wife to trust you. And well, she's going to have a hard time trusting you because if you said God did this, said this, and God said this, and God said this, and every time you said God said something that failed miserably, then she began to wonder, what God she, is he talking to? That might not be the right God, because that God's not, he, he doesn't have a clue about what's going on. He's totally confused. 
Amen. But see, if we're not in a position to bless, we can't bless, can we? But God wants us to be there. Yeah. And you know something? God's ability to provide that abundance for us to be a blessing is not based upon a specific job. God doesn't have to have a specific job for you to be blessed. Don't put God in a box. God's well able. And if you've been faithful to do what the Lord says to do, and if you've been a tither and a giver, and your heart's right and you're serving Him, it doesn't matter when changes come. I found this. God just keeps moving us up higher. Amen. Well, it, 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 you might be working a specific job, okay? And maybe that job ends. Well, your, your, your source of provision doesn't just come from that specific job. See, does that make sense? I know everybody else knew that. <laughs> no, no, you don't have to. That's the problem. See, that's the misconception. And you know how that misconception's come about? Is through preachers being... Uh, misusing the truth when they're teaching about money. See, give to the preacher, give to the preacher, give to the preacher, give to the preacher, give to the preacher. Sow in this ministry. If you sow in this ministry, I'll guarantee you, I'll pray. The Lord said, if you sow in this ministry, that I can pray for you to have a hundredfold return on this offering. I don't see anywhere in the Scripture where I can make that guarantee because I don't know what's going on in somebody's life. And I know this, if their life does not line up with the Word, they're going to be hard-pressed to get something that the Bible says they won't get if their life's not in a position for them to get it. Amen. You know, and it's easy to make those statements because, you know, man, I don't want to get on it. If you, if you, if you ever want to, I go into great detail. I taught 15 services on prosperity. You can go watch them on, on the, our, the YouTube channel, and I encourage you to go watch them because I go into great detail talking about that very thing, that very thing. See, God is not just for the preacher. It's for everybody, everybody that will do what the Word says, okay, everybody. And I just say it this way, there's a lot of preachers that are flat broke. They don't have a dime. I'm serious, because they don't know anything about what the Word of God says. They don't know the, about the laws of sowing and reaping, tithing, those things like that. We're supposed, we tithe, I mean, the preacher, I've always, my wife and I have always tithed. That's right. There's only been two times that we ever messed up our tithe, and that's because we listened to stupid people. <laughs> <coughs> two times we got in trouble, you know, financially. One was when we first got saved, we just didn't know a whole lot. And so we listen to ourselves. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so when I say stupid people, we listen to our we listen to our flesh. That was stupid, amen. And so we decided, well, we can, you know, we you know, God started blessing us, and so we bought this, and you know, and then, then we thought, well, we'll buy this, and and then so we bought a few things we shouldn't, that we just weren't in position to pay for, you know. And so we thought, well, we'll use our tithe money because the bill came due, and I said, well, we we'll use our tithe money, and uh, we use our tithe money, and I mean, we was under a curse immediately. I mean, as soon as we used the money, we were under the curse. It didn't take a day. It didn't take a week. It was in a absolutely in seconds we were under a curse. Now, why was we under a curse? Because when we got saved, the first church service I went to, God taught me about the tithe, not the preacher. I never heard a pe preacher preach on tithing for years. God taught me about the tithe. He said this to me. The first church service we're sitting there, he spoke to me and said, I get a penny out of every dime, a dime out of every dollar, a dollar out of every ten, ten out of every hundred, a hundred out of every thousand, and so on and so forth. And God taught me about the tithe. And so if God teaches you, you can't violate it. You can't say, well, that was just a preacher wanting my money. <laughs> preacher never said a word about it. God told me that. And so we used that tithe money, and we was instantly under a curse and miserable. Well, see, I don't like being miserable, so it only took a day or two for us to get it fixed. So I told Jan, I said, we missed it. I said, we'll just scrounge up all the money we got. We'll get this thing fixed, and we did. And immediately we was out from under the curse, immediately. 
And, you know, after that, even, and we still had those things, those items. We still had those items. But you know what? We was able to pay them off. And if you tried to figure it out on paper, it was impossible. You say, you know, there's all, this is all the money we got here, but we paid these bills. How did we do it? I don't know, but it was there. It got done. It was amazing. And then when we was in ministry one time, you know, this gal, you know, she's a Raymond grad, and she started talking about, well, you know, the Lord said, you know, once you get, in, when you start in ministry, you don't have to tithe anymore. Well, we, we was stupid, and we listened to that for a second. What do you mean a second? Because that's all it takes for us to get under a curse. Stop tithing, and a second later, we're under a curse, because we know, because God taught me about the tithe. And so, I mean, we, we were in East St. Louis doing a tent revival, and I mean, and we had a pack of bologna, uh, not bologna, but a pack of hot dogs. That's all we had to eat, period. We had payments due and some sound equipment that we had, had, to, had, had to have and bought. And I mean, and it's like, and, and it was just awful. And so I told Janet, I said, this is not right. I said, we missed it. I said, that was not wrong. We should have never listened to that person. We should have never, ever, ever did that. That was wrong. Let's fix it. Let's fix it now. How much money do we have? She said, we got $163. I said, write a check for every penny of it and send it to Rama right now. And it's, listen, this, 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 this is on a, in an af the afternoon, okay, hot afternoon, matter of fact. This is the afternoon. She wrote that check for $163. She put it in an envelope, and we went, sent that off. And within 24 hours, we had $1,800 cash in 24 hours. I'm just preaching that night. This all happened in that, that day. That day. It all happened that day. And so there was a guy just come walking up to the trailer. Service wasn't going on anything. And just knocked on the door and said, the Lord said to give you this and hand us a $100 bill. That's the first thing that happened. I'm preaching that night. And the guy, I watched him. He's walking down the sidewalk. He's just walking down the sidewalk. And I could see because we had all the flaps out, you know. And he's walking down the, si the sidewalk. And he just made a left turn. And there's people out here I'm preaching to, and I, I'm watching him while I'm preaching. He just made a left turn and walked right in the tent and walked right up to me and handed me money and walked right out the other side and kept going. A guy came to me after the service and said, the Lord said to pay off that soundboard. How much do you owe? Wrote me a check for it. Then somebody else came to me and said, the Lord told me to pay off that soundboard. How much do you owe? I said, don't know anything. Somebody just paid it off. He said, well, the Lord told me to do it anyway, so I'm just going to write you a check for how much ever it was. In 24 hours, we had $1,800. And we, we paid tithes on that. You know that. <laughs> Amen. See? Well, that's because no, it had nothing to do with me being a preacher. It had nothing to do with me being a preacher. If it don't work for everybody, it don't work for anybody. That's just the way it is. When you look back to the children of Israel, you know, God, you pay tithes on increase. If you don't have any increase, you can't pay tithes. And so God realizes tithes is something that has to be there for the church to operate and function. Isn't that right? The local church. People don't pay tithes to this tent ministry. They don't pay tithes to David Harvison Ministries. People in our church pay tithes to Victory Family Church. They don't pay tithes to David Harvison Ministries. Because you don't pay tithes to any type of traveling ministry. You pay tithes to your local church. And you have to have that for the church to function. But you also have to pay your tithes for you to, to live and walk and live in abundance. It positions you for you to get that next 100%. You keep 90 and you give God 10. And then he brings it in again, and you get another 100% increase, comes in, okay? Then he says, you keep 90 and give me 10. That's a pretty good deal. God, get, God made us a pretty good deal, didn't he? I mean, if somebody, you know, just said, all right, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless you, and you just, you just get, you, you keep 90 and give me 10. And every time the increase comes, you just keep 90, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back you. I'm going to make sure you get the increase, and you just keep 90%, and you give me 10. That, boy, who wouldn't jump in a business venture like that? But that's what the Bible says. And he, you know, but we have to walk in the light. If we don't walk in the light, then we're not in a position for the blessings to come. And we don't want to get into detail talking about it now because it takes, it take, like I said, I spent 15 services and people in our church will tell you, I'm not just normally, I'm not a 40-minute, 50-minute preacher, especially when I'm teaching something like that. I mean, I'm really on it. But I will say this, and I talk about it very extensively in that teaching, 
we're not supposed to use our position for gain as ministers. Abraham, just a little tidbit, before we stop. Whenever Sarah died, Abraham wanted a place to bury his wife. When he went and asked them to sell him a parcel of land, they said to Abraham, you're a prince amongst us. What does that mean? That means he had a high position. You're a prince amongst us. And so what is that to you? You just take the land and bury your dead. And Abraham said, I'm not going to do it. You tell me what you want for it. Are you listening? Tell me what you want for it. I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm going to pay you for that. Well, it's worth so much, but what's that between me and you? It's a big deal to Abraham. See, Abraham wasn't going to use his position in order to get that. And a lot of, a lot of preachers will do that. Now, did anybody ever, ever just give to Abraham and just bless Abraham? Absolutely. Pharaoh did. Abimelech did. They gave to him. They blessed him. But see, he wasn't going to just go out and use his position to get gain. And I have seen people do it. I've seen preachers do it. I've seen them use their positions for the sole purpose of getting gain. You know, not that you can't bless them because I've had people, and I've blessed other ministers. But if I run across one that's using their, their, their position for gain, they don't get anything from me unless God specifically says. I'm just being honest about it because that violates the Scripture. And if, you use, if you're purposely using your position to get gain, then you're missing the mark as a minister. And there could be ministers watching, which I'm sure there will be. You can't use your position for gain. That's not the way this thing works. That's right. See, Abraham had seven things that he did. His character was the number one thing for the blessing. One is he forsook all to obey God. He followed God. Number two, he didn't turn back when tests and trials came. When things got, got hard, he never turned back. Abraham was generous and honest. Look what he did with Lot, that little greedy bugger, his nephew. He wouldn't have had a thing without Abraham. But when their herds and everything is so big that their you know, they're, 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 they're servants are fighting amongst themselves over who gets what parcel of land, Abraham went to Lot over and said, listen, we got problems here. we got strife. We don't want any strife. And Abraham said, you pick what you want, and I'll just take the rest. And so what did he do? Lot set his face towards Sodom because the Bible literally says... For it was as the garden of the Lord. It was a beautiful place. And Abraham said, go ahead, you take it. And I'll just take what's left. And after Lot moved off, then God took Abraham for a walk. Hallelujah, how good God is. He took Abraham for a walk, and they walked out, and he said, now Abraham, see all this? I'm going to give all this to you and to your children. It all belongs to you. Lot lost everything he had. And Abraham got great blessing. And his children were blessed. And they're still blessed because the covenant's still intact. Amen. Abraham didn't use his position for gain. He wouldn't do that. Are you listening? Abraham obeyed God. He also obeyed the law of the tithe. But there was only one thing with Abraham that had to do with, him, with money from him, from him. Only one thing, that was the tithe. The other six things that Abraham did all had to do with his character. See, if you, can't, if you don't have character, you can't handle money. You can look at that by you know, children that inherit billions of dollars and, and just absolutely become a mess because they don't have the character to handle what it is that they have. It was Abraham's character that positioned him to be able to handle the blessings that God would give him by walking in obedience to the law of the tithe. But without the character, the blessings would have never been able to operate in his life. And that's why our character is such a big deal. Yeah. How we are about money. And I know, I watch it, I watch it on TV, I watch and listen to preachers, I hear them say things, 
and I, and I cringe every time I hear him say it. I cringe. I've heard preachers say, I've heard nationally, no, internationally known preachers say that the prosperity message is for America. It doesn't work anywhere else. Then we need to throw the Bible away because God lied. But it works everywhere. It works absolutely everywhere. Everywhere you go, it works. It may be a little bit different, but it works everywhere. There was a young man, Alice, was you didn't want to tell us about the guy in India, Alice? Young man in India, in, he was on the street, wasn't he? Living on the street, making grass mats. Got saved, and God started blessing him. Now that guy that was on, in India, on the street, making grass mats with his hands, now is worth over a million dollars. That's India. It works there, too. It doesn't just work in America. Yeah. And when people say the prosperity gospel is, a, is an American gospel, no, it's not. It's a biblical gospel. But it all goes in line with what the Word says. Can you misuse it and get in the ditch? You bet you can. But we're not going to do that, are we? We're going to just stand on what the Word says, and God wants every one of us to prosper. Every single one. And that means He wants you to prosper, too, just as much as the preachers you see on TV. Amen. Amen. He, does. Yes, he does. He wants you to be blessed too, just like everybody else. Amen. Hallelujah. And another thing you got to be careful about, if you're, if you're trying to endeavor to use your finances to garner favor with the preacher, then you need to judge your heart too. Because you're trying to buy your way in a position, and that's not the way we do this. That's not the way I do it. I know when Solomon said that your gift to make room for it, you've got to bring it before great men, he was talking about a couple of different things there. But one thing he was teaching his young sons was, as a king, when you go to, you know, get the audience of the year of another king, then you always take a gift with them when you go. But I've seen people, I've had preachers tell me, well, you know, he's talking about money, so, so if you want to, you know, if you want to do that, if you want to come before great men, great preachers, then you need to start putting money in your pocket. You know, I've never done that to this very day, nor will I ever. If the Lord tells me to bless them, I'll bless them. But if God doesn't tell me, you won't see me padding their hands with $100 bills. I won't do it. Well, maybe that might be to your detriment. Maybe it is, but I know my heart's right before God. I know I'm not trying to use, use, use money to try to get, get my way in somewhere. I'm not going to do it. Amen. I'm thoroughly convinced, and he can testify whether it's true or not, that Kim Ernst did not take it upon himself to help us do what we do in tent ministry because of the money I gave him. Did you? But you want to know why he did? I'll tell you why he did. I was there. When we were praying... And the Holy Ghost came on me. He, him, Kevin Ashby helped me pray something through in the Spirit. And as I sat there in that cabin on Wren Lake and sobbed, did I not? As I was trying to get that thing prayed out. Trying to get it prayed out. And they came over and laid their hands on me and started praying with me. And that thing prayed, I pray, we got that thing prayed through. And God said, this is what I want you to do. And that started us on a journey that's going to take us way further than where we are right now. But that started us on that journey again because I had gotten off the journey for a while. Even though the Lord was dealing with me about traveling more, I, was, I backed away from it. And that started me back on the journey. And I turned around and, and Pastor Cam was standing there with tears running down his face. And he said, I believe the Lord's telling me I'm supposed to help you. And the rest is history. Had nothing to do with money. Did it? It had to do with the call of God. And that's the way I feel about it. I didn't give, my, I, and we, we sold lots of money into Kenneth Hagin Ministries. I didn't give it. I didn't give it to get an audience with him. I didn't do it in such a way to make sure that he knew I gave it. Never did it. Could I have done some things differently and made sure I had an audience with him? I probably could have. But I didn't do it that way. 
I gave it to the Lord. And in doing so, the Lord told me to give it to that ministry. And I did it. And I did, did the way I felt the Lord told me to do it. I didn't do it to garner, you know, an audience or to get all these little perks from it. I did it just because the Lord told me to do it, and I did it out of obedience. And could I have done something differently, maybe try to fast-track ministry? Maybe. But if I would have, my heart wouldn't have been right. I think I'd have been a sellout. And I just couldn't do it. Amen. But it works. The stuff really works. And we've proven it. Do we have what everybody else has? No. Because we haven't necessarily needed some of the things other people have. Are you down on people with airplanes? Nope. Because if we need one, we're going to get one. And there's times in recent times we've been thinking about it. We're traveling all over the country. You know, Pastor Kim needs to be able to get back for church and stuff like that. And we need to be able to get back and forth and do things like that. I said, Lord, I'm starting to really wonder, do we need an airplane? We do. Fly him back on Saturday so he can do his Sunday services and fly back out Sunday afternoon. Yep, fly us back so we can do our stuff and fly back. Yep, I can see there could be a need for it. And if we need it, God will supply it. But we're not just going to have one to say, hey, I got one. One, I just want the headache of having to deal with it for that. I mean, <laughs> we got one. I want it because we need one. And yeah, it would be a convenience. But until the Lord says, you need one now, then he'll provide it. But until then, we'll just, you know... I, I, my, my position, you know, my personal opinion, we'd be throwing effort after foolishness because if we don't need it, we don't need it. Not yet. Now, if somebody's out there watching and say, well, I got a corporate jet. You don't even need it. I'll just fly you guys around and say, well, take it. <laughs> Amen. Come pick us up. We're ready to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Did you all get anything out of this this morning? Hallelujah. But Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you it's working in our hearts and our lives. And we thank you that we are wonderfully, gloriously blessed. We thank you for the victory we have. We thank you we have been redeemed from the curse. And we thank you, Lord, the blessings of Abraham are overtaking each and every one of us. And, Lord, that's the blessing of health and victory and, and, and prosperity and all those things that belongs to us. And, Father, we thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' wonderful and holy name. Amen. We're going to receive this morning's offering. If you'd like to give in it, you can. You don't have to. And there's no force, no pressure. But we're giving you an opportunity. Amen. And if you want an envelope for your giving, raise your hand. Usher's a give one. If you want to make out a check, make it out to David Harvison Ministries. No pressure in any way, shape, or form. As, was, as we said just a few minutes ago, you pay your tithes to your local church. You don't pay tithes to a traveling preacher. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for everyone's giving in this offering. We thank you for giving back to them good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. You'll cause men to give into their bosom. Father, we thank you that every need of every individual is met. We thank you every bill they have is paid in full. And we thank you that every need of this ministry is met and every bill of this ministry is paid in full as well. In Jesus' wonderful and holy name, amen. Go right ahead and receive the offering. By way of announcements, don't forget CDs available of every service. You can watch us on YouTube at this victory number for you. And this is our YouTube channel. Or you can go back to the back. You want to sign up for our, our mailing list, and we'll let you know where we're going to be whenever we're going to be there. Hallelujah. There are CDs available. These services, that they're, they're available now. And of all the other services throughout this last week and this week, they're all available free of charge. Go and help yourself to those things. Uh, if you're looking for a church in the area don't have one, I recommend highly. When I say highly, I mean highly. I highly recommend Faith Fellowship right here the building right there. I highly recommend it. Pastor Kim Ernst is the pastor and I highly recommend him as a pastor as well. And I highly recommend his wife, Jennifer, who's right here. And I highly recommend all the people here in this church because they have, they're like a second family to us. They are a tremendous wonderful blessing. Why? Because they give you money? No, because they love us. They love us. Amen. They love us. And when they come and give me a hug, it's real. Amen. It's not, they don't come and give me a hug like because I'm trying to, you know, they're trying to get something from me. They come and hug me because they love me. Amen. But then they bring me tomatoes. That's a good thing. Amen. And they cook for me, and not just me, for our whole group. And I will tell you this: the food has been absolutely phenomenal. 
Now, I don't know if those was pork chops or pork steaks yesterday. We're still trying to understand because if they were pork chops, they were some kind of big pork chops. They were, and they were yummy. They were yummy. They were yummy. And I mean, and Jennifer made some ham the other night, and it was like, wow. And, you know, and Johnny was like in there eating the broth and saying, man, this is good. So they, they saved the broth. They saved it to make something out of it. You know, no, I mean, because it was, it was yummy. I mean, I munched it and had to have a little more. And I've been trying to be a good boy, you know. I'm trying to release myself of some extra added benefits I've had for all these years. And, uh, boy, it's tough when you got that kind of food. But I will say this. We haven't been jam-packed with sweets, and we appreciate that because I love sweets. And they, unfortunately, they love me too much, too. And they just hang around forever. So, uh, but we, it's been fantastic. And that's because the folks here love us. And we love you, too. Amen. We was praying the other night and afterwards. Rick was back here and he gave me a big old hug. Just like your brother hugging you. Amen. You know, Larry, Ron, everybody here just loves us. We love you guys. It's just a blessing. Makes it real easy. It really does. Makes it real easy. Praise the Lord. All right, let's stand. Don't forget service tonight at 7 o'clock. Invite someone. Hallelujah. Tell them you're missing half your life. If you don't come, amen. And you never know what God's going to do. I mean, you never know. I'm telling you, you just never know what God's going to do. And I, uh, let me just, you can stand for just a second, but let me just share this with you real quick. One year at camp meeting, Brother Hagen was teaching on the ABCs of faith. And so we had some friends of ours that we knew that came from St. Louis to the meeting. And so we were talking to them, and they said, I think we're leaving tomorrow. And so I said, why? I said, because he's teaching on the ABCs of faith. And there's nothing big happening. And so they took off, you know. And I was so excited he was teaching on the ABCs of faith. I said, what do you mean he's teaching the ABCs of faith? This is fantastic. And so they left because nothing big was happening. And that, ni that, that night, they left that day. That night, Brother Hagin's preaching, and all of a sudden a person disappears from him in front of him from India. Guy just appears, just like, like in Macedonia. Remember with Paul, Macedon, Macedonia, Paul, the guy appeared to Paul and said, come to Macedonia also? It's like he appeared right there in front of Brother Hagin, right there. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? And said, now John Osteen, has been God's been talking to him about coming to India and doing some things. He's kind of been wondering about it. Tell him he's supposed to come. Brother Hagin looks at John Osteen and said, are you planning on doing something in India? Thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, we've been thinking. We've been praying about it. And Brother Higgins said, well, there's a man standing here right now. And he said to tell you that God said you're supposed to come. And so that opened the door for John Osi. He obeyed God. And they went and did tremendous things and still are doing tremendous things in India because of that. See, they missed out on that whole thing because they didn't come because it didn't seem like anything was happening. And then all of a sudden God blows up with something spectacular. Well, you never know what's going to happen at any given time, at any given moment, any given service. You never know. I mean, you could miss tonight, and there could be a whole band of angels come rolling in. Ah, oh, you never had angels. Yeah, yeah. We was in East St. Louis doing a meeting. We had a lady singing a cappella, and all of a sudden, everybody there heard it. All of a sudden, there was a whole choir started singing, and you couldn't see them. And instruments were playing, and we didn't have any instruments on the platform. There were no instruments in the whole tent. A whole choir and a whole orchestra started playing music. We was down in Belleville, was it last year? The lady that was singing a cappella, Edna Letha Long, she came up and testified. Because she was the one that was singing when it happened. I realize pretty awesome stuff. You got a woman singing a cappella, and all of a sudden a whole choir starts singing, and everybody's looking around, where are they at? And all of a sudden an orchestra starts playing music, and there's no instruments, and you're, that's a pretty cool thing. Never know when stuff like that's going to happen. Amen. Father, we thank you for blessed, precious, and wonderful people. We thank you, Lord God, for a great day today. We thank you for a great night tonight. And we thank you, Lord, for tomorrow as well, because we know you're a great God every single day. We give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're just a mess. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them you love them. Hallelujah.